This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show Fernando Chito Filamarino. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I'm glad I did not massacre it too badly, uh, Fernando. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for being on the show, my friend. I, uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, you, we're going to get deep into the weeds on your new film, Beckett, which I absolutely adored, uh, that's coming up on Netflix soon. But uh, before we even get into that, how did you get started in the film business? I, uh, well, it's this, the question is specific because it's how I got started in the business. Because I guess as a small premise, I always decided, I would say from the age of, this, the beginning of reason, about 11, 12, when you start mm-hmm. having ideas, even though they're ridiculous at that age, because you're <laughs> just a little kid, I had decided that I wanted to make movies somehow. Um, so then, you know, I, you know, I went to high school and, and, and everything, and, I, and then I went to, to university. In Italy, we don't really have, we have a couple of film schools, but uh, at, at uh, university or college, the film programs are just are film studies. So you watch films and you read books and you, you know, analyze them and stuff like that. It's not about the filmmaking process. So I, I did that, and then after that, uh, I was by the you know by then I was uh, 21, um, and I was desperate for film sets mm-hmm. uh, because I had been so many years. Just imagining, I want to make this movie and that movie, and I love these movies for these reasons. And okay, let's study film history because I love it, so it's fine. Uh, but you know, I was interested in filmmaking, so I, I, then all of this, uh, all of these years, fueled the absolute obsession with which I, I looked for a film job first when I got when I graduated from university, uh, looking as a, for jobs as an AD, basically as an assistant director on anything. I looked in Italy which is difficult also in Italy. I mean, I mean Italy has a, a pretty healthy production, but not, you know, if you compare it to uh, America, for sure, there are many less, many fewer uh, films produced. But I also looked in the UK because at the time my girlfriend lived there, so I could crash at her place. Uh, <laughs> I had friends, I, I don't know, I just, I did everything I could and I landed my first job as, a, as an assistant director on a film by Richard Eyre uh, called the other man mm-hmm. and on that and I had I had no experience on film sets at all so it was funny because they uh, the film had kind of an Italian mini section to it which is I think why they hired me uh, although ironically even though they went to shoot in, in Milan which is my hometown they didn't bring me there because it was too expensive <laughs> so I only worked in the UK part of the shoot although the only reason they hired me was I was Italian Right, of that, course. Aside, basically, I, I had no skills except enthusiasm. So they just like, all right, so I don't know, uh, hold this ladder while the gaffer works on that window. Uh, and this, my first days were literally like this, just sort of, I don't know what, what you could do, just do that. Um, make this coffee. And I was, of course, miles away from the director and the cast. Uh, I did Red Light and Bell which is in the UK, they do this thing where before shooting in some productions, at least before shooting, you, you ring a bell three times and a red light flashes. So everyone knows they're shooting and they keep quiet and hold the work. I did that. So that was my first experience in my way into the business. Although, uh, and actually it was a very important experience because I was so unimportant and I had so zero responsibilities, although by the end they did allow me to bring the cast to set and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which was Liam Neeson and Antonio Banderas and Laura Linney, I should say. So pretty so, cool. Yeah. For a, at that in that position, uh, and I got to know what everyone did on set. As a, as a guy who doesn't, you know, uh, I just of course there were so many people I, I knew about the heads of department from mm-hmm. my film studies, but not what like the prop master. I wasn't sure what a prop master did then. So, you know, that would come in handy, very handy later uh, when I had my first crew on my first short film. But then I got back to Milan, uh, which is my hometown, 
at exactly the same time, Luca Guadagnino was coming to Milan to uh, his movie I Am Love. And he was looking for people to uh, to collaborate with him and to help him understand some things of the city, find certain types of locations and find people to be in the film that wouldn't be actors, but that would be people from the world he was portraying in the film. And because I was looking for work and he was looking for such a person, we, we found each other through mutual connections. And uh, and I did that film and that was a completely different experience. And I, I got to work very closely with him and got to know his working method really closely and all his collaborators too, which eventually became also my collaborators, some of them anyway. Um, so that was, and, and that, meeting with him and, and with his uh, producing partner, Marco Morabito, would turn out to be life-changing in some ways because aside from personal relationships, what happened is I wrote an idea for a short film after that movie was over and I showed it to Luca, who showed it to Marco, and the two of them said like, this is great, we want to produce it. Uh, and uh, of course I was so happy and then it took a year and a half of work to put it together. <laughs> uh, you mean you, you mean to tell me it didn't ha- you mean to tell me it didn't happen overnight? They didn't just write a check and then you were shooting no, the next week. Three weeks later, we were shooting. You know, <laughs> no, it was it was a long journey. Also, I was right right. I was a little ambitious in what I wanted to do with the actors. For obviously, it was very con- uh, conceived to be in one location, a villa, uh, with just a, like a car scene outside of it. So something that would make sense, but I, 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 my ambition was to work with great uh, actors, and I, even with writing, I already had an idea of who I wanted to approach for those roles, and they were important actors in Europe and in uh, in France and in Italy. Uh, but you know, and that's what all that time, <laughs> you know, took. But between finding financing, and you know, I still have some debts from that, by the way. <laughs> uh, I do, really. No, uh, I'm sure. I'm and, sure you do. And, and, and coming around to those actors, which eventually, you know, embraced the project and did it, uh, that took a while. And that was my first, you know, I did I did video stuff beforehand. I was a video maker. I did stuff for the internet, uh, stuff for hire, small, silly things. But that I would, I would consider that short film, which was called Diarchy, my first piece of work as a, as a filmmaker. Uh, for cinema, let's say, um, and that. Uh, so I guess that's how I got into the business. To answer a very long <laughs> to your question. Fair enough. Now, when you made your first short film, what was the biggest lesson you learned uh, on that? On that, because you must have been being bombarded with lessons on a daily basis during that year and a half, and even through production and afterwards. So, what was the biggest thing you learned making that first film? Well, something that I, I happened to me, I, I have to say naturally, was uh, uh, over-preparing. Mm-hmm. And one big lesson I learned is it's never enough. <laughs> 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 I, you know, I, all that time, that all that hardship, that I learned not during the making, but I guess during the development, is, you know, be ready to be sad all the time and depressed. <laughs> And uh, feel like it's never gonna work out, and p- people say no, and then they, or, or even worse, they say yes, and then they change their mind and they say no, and, and you know, especially looking for funding. Uh, but you know, by the time it got to set, all that time had passed. I had thought about every inch of this short film, how I wanted to shoot it, how I wanted the performances to be, and everything. But all that preparation, I realized, uh, you know. I understood, first of all, something that is pretty obvious, which is the amazing luck of working with great performers. Because I could have I envisioned everything, but then the most beautiful thing is when one of the actors, like Louis Garel, who is a very natural uh, actor who goes by very much by his own instinct and intuition, everything that he came up with that I, I, I could not have envisioned was gold. But to go back to what I was saying earlier, there's still so many unexpected things that happen when you're actually shooting something and just even even like this example also the things that come out of collaborators and actors there is just not no limit to how much you can uh bring in 
and then still be surprised. I, I, and then also, there's no limit to how much you can prepare and still feel unprepared on the day <laughs> because, because of the unexpected. Uh, and so, you know, that was, uh, uh, I guess, a hard, a hard lesson to learn. But what one, you know, a, a, a lesson I learned even later in making uh, my first feature and then eventually my second is the importance of sleep. <laughs> I actually yes. learned that on my short film. I did not learn that because I basically did not sleep for the whole six days of shooting Oof. because I was excited because I was worrying about everything and you know on day five uh, I literally walked into my hotel room and I fainted <laughs> to sleep but I because I hadn't fall, I hadn't slept all of it because I felt I, I had more important things to do than sleep I have to think about tomorrow to go over the shots I envisioned and and uh, you know prepare uh, but that was a mistake uh, and I, I, I learned only later the importance of, you know, shutting down and actually falling asleep and letting sleep do its, its work as well. Absolutely. No, trust me, I completely understand. And, and as you get older, you realize about sleep. Because <laughs> yeah, when, you're, you're, when you're young, you think you could do anything. Yeah, yeah I was a little young when I, started, when I did that short film. Uh, so, I, of course, I, I couldn't even physically do that now. <laughs> but, uh, yes, me too, my yeah. friend. <laughs> now, did you? No. So when you went to your when you went on uh, on day one with your uh, with your short film, I do this all the time, and especially when I was first starting out, I really did this. I showed up and I, I showed my first AD and my DP the shots, the shot list for the yeah. day, uh, at least yeah. for the first half of the day, and I would show up with like you know 175 shots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the, the and then the season first first AD and the season DP would go. That's nice. What do you want to cut? Did you did you do that, or do you kind of show up with a bunch of like you know? I always like to overshoot, so I always prepare like thirty or forty shots, well knowing that I'll get ten of them uh, if I'm lucky that day. But at least I have that just in case there is where things are moving, things are going quick, and then I kind of get what I want. Is that the way you approach that first short? Um, I, probably out of enthusiasm, I did have more. <laughs> Uh, then was feasible because, of course, I didn't have the experience to know what would be feasible right. for sure. However, in general, I have to say my approach is different, and I and I, I tend to do the opposite and and try to think more about how less shots can do the trick. The, oh, actually, I mean it depends also on what the what the film is and what mm -hmm. the story requires in terms of pace. For mm -hmm. example, that was a uh, quite. Uh, you know, that short film had to do with something that was burning slow and, and undercurring and uh, a, a building tension. Right. Uh, you know, it wasn't action packed or anything. Um, it was about the hidden part of a relationship between two friends, let's say, and the tension that was there. And then it sort of bursts for a moment. So, you know, I, I didn't think I would need fast cutting anything, mm -hmm. you know. So in, in that sense, I have to say, even though I may have over, over, over you know, overestimated what we could shoot, I, I, I don't have that tendency. Uh, I didn't have that tendency on that or on my first film, but rather, uh, I guess the difficulty of the shots that I came up with, whether, you know, they were realistically feasible to do or not. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then, yes. you know, there was rain, and uh, yeah, and it's all of this is going to be covered in rain, and then we'll have the rain out the window, and the like. Sure. Yeah, we can't afford that. <laughs> so there's just one guy spraying water on the window like this. <laughs> right. Yeah. In the in the in in the director's imagination, you have rainmakers. You've got you know rain all over the place. You've got the wide shot. You've got lights for a mile down, so you can get these full view shots. And it ends yeah. up with a it ends up with a grip with a hose on a window. <laughs> That's exactly how it actually, well, like, we couldn't have the hose because it wasn't the second floor. So it was literally it, a little spray thing yeah, was, like this. Some poor grip si on, outside going. Sh -sh -sh -sh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Now, how right. did you how did you leverage the short film into your first feature film? Because that's a lot of filmmakers are trying to figure out getting their first short film and how they can leverage that to get access to making an actual feature. I am afraid I did not think that much ahead. <laughs> I think, <laughs> uh, look, I had an idea for a short film, which 
was uh, an idea, a concept, and therefore would work for a short film. I actually am generally, you know, what I love about movies is something to do with creating a world and creating a narrative and then challenging that narrative and challenging the experience of watching the movie. So it kind of is about features. Uh, so this idea I had had was not was never really going to work for a feature. It was it was something that would work for something limited in time. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, I just kind of conceived that project as it was as a as a, as a uh, and the idea. I mean, I'll tell you uh, without getting into the story. The concept was also seeing uh, as if it was a piece of a bigger film, but o the only very important piece of it. You know, uh, so you see those two people driving in the car and they're all, they've obviously done something before and then something is obviously going to happen later but you're seeing the most important piece and that's it that fragment of sorts like a dream really um where you can't really remember what was before and you can't really remember what happened after but this is the important bit of the dream uh so in that sense uh i guess in terms of long lead projects i i did not think i had that way i thought this is cool for a short film. Let's make it the best way we can. And then, and then, I, actually, I was writing a, a feature which had absolutely nothing to do with mm -hmm. this, which was gonna be um, uh, epic. Mm -hmm. Obviously, obviously, too obviously, epic. obviously epic. Obviously, too epic. Uh, <laughs> and so, when I realized how difficult it was to finance this short film. And then eventually how difficult it would be to finance that feature, which was too epic. Um, talking with my producers about this conundrum, uh, then, then this other idea came along to make what actually became my first feature, which was something smaller, more manageable. Yeah, and, and, and then uh, with the success of that, how did you get uh, involved with Beckett? I mean, because that's a fairly big jump from where you were to an F, yeah. to an to an action movie with a major major up and coming star if not already a star yeah. uh, as well and yeah, Oscar Oscar winner uh, with Alicia in there and uh, I mean it's just amazing so how did you get involved with uh, Beckett Look uh, uh, first of all I should specify that and it it depends the perspective but my first feature was you know it had a beautiful festival run won awards. Uh, got some very nice reviews, uh, but you know, it only got distributed in Italy. It wasn't, right. and, and, on, and on MUBI internationally, mm -hmm. but you know, it, it, was a, it was a tiny film, it was a very niche thing. Uh, so uh, it comes into play, but it's not, I would say, because of, well, I guess you can be the judge of that. I'll tell you how I think it comes into play, because actually Beckett, and the genre of Beckett, which let's say is sort of a dramatic manhunt thriller, mm -hmm. is something I have always wanted to play with, something I have always loved in movies, ever since I was a little kid, in fact. Mm -hmm. You know, what my, the first filmmaker I ever loved very much was, was Brian De Palma, which, mm. manhunt, manhunt aside, the, the way he deals with genre and different ones at that, with such a personal point of view and such warm and and uh, dramatic characters was something that always inspired me from the get-go and then i guess that inspiration uh i applied of manhunt literature but also movies and so i i always knew i wanted to make a movie in those uh, in that realm let's say uh but obviously it was going to be something more ambitious uh, and that could not have been something made as a first feature, at least the way I envisioned it. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I wanted, you know, to create a world wide, wide enough to contain something as, as strong as I, I would like it to be. Um, but so, you know, what happened is I, I conceived this, this story based on, on what I loved and what I wanted to make more personal than mine. Also adding something that would be that would feel fresh today in the genre, because, of course, we have seen many Manhunt films, but I, I like the idea of trying to make something new, as I'm sure everyone does. Um, uh, after, and after finding my angle, I, you know, we approached these actors and, you know, the first thing that happens is they react to what's on the page. John David 
liked what he read. He liked the idea that this character was completely unusual for this genre. And it was a dramatic character, a man who was going through a personal crisis and who was completely unfit to be, you know, experiencing what happens in the film and definitely not your typical hero per se, not skilled as a hero of these types of films. And then I guess what my first feature, you know, when he read that, we sent him my first feature just, you know, oh, and this is the guy who conceived the movie and is going to direct it. And then we had our meeting. And when we had our meeting, the first 15 minutes, John David spoke about my first feature because he loved it. I love this. I love that. I love that performance. And he spoke about that scene at the beginning. And I think that it was an amazing icebreaker, of course, because uh, that movie was so different. You know, it was a portrait of a poet from the 1930s, but yet he could connect to something on there uh, that was that had to do with the portrayal of character, which, of course, would come into play in our conversation in Beckett, because actually Beckett is a dramatic character. And so in some ways there was something there, I guess, to um, argue similarities, at least in approach. Mm -hmm. then, of course, the genre would be different. So, you know, I, I like to think that that first feature I did, even though John David would not have seen it unless we'd sent it to him in the context of reading Beckett, it helped our relationship, our dialogue, maybe even his uh, belief in, in me, you know. So it did come into play in that sense. And then, um, so you just basically <clears throat> sent the script out to John David's people. He read it. He liked it. He met with you. At that point, then you started looking for financing or was Netflix attached? How did that work? No, Netflix was not attached. We, we financed the film completely independently with the hard work of, of uh, my producers. Uh, it was in tandem. You know, we were, we were shopping the movie uh, to financiers and uh, simultaneously casting it. Uh, and then, of course, when John David decided to make the movie, that, that was a, it started to become a very specific package that we could have, and then eventually we managed to finance it, actually with mostly European money, a lot of Italian money, mm -hmm. and a slice of uh, Brazilian money. Uh, and then we made the film completely independently, and then Netflix picked it up once we'd finished it as a distributor. Interesting. So then <clears throat> one thing I've always found... I found issues going through my journeys in Hollywood, especially when I was coming up, is when you do one genre like you did with your first movie, which was much more character based, and you want to jump genre to essentially a dramatic action film, you know, because there's a lot of a lot of stunts, yeah. a lot of actions. Uh, a lot of times, uh, especially if you're just a director, they say, oh, well, he has no directing. He has no skill and he has never shot action before. How can we give him millions of dollars to shoot an action? But the big difference with you is that you were also the creator behind it. So you kind of had to like, if you want the movie, you got to bring me along for the ride. Is that kind of how it worked? And, and did you did you come into those walls? Did you hit those walls? Well, no, no, you're absolutely right. I got <laughs> asked the question, why, many times. <laughs> why You made the poet movie, why do you want to do this? <laughs> I'm like, what's the problem with doing both? I mean, I love poets. <laughs> sure. I love artists. I thought that movie had a reason to exist because... Uh, it was interesting to me to see, you know, there aren't that many movies about poets and I thought it would be interesting to make a movie about poetry and the, the creative process of a poet. And I also find it interesting to make a Manhunt film with a very dramatic character at its center. Why, why can't that be? Right. Uh, and and, and I'm, a, I'm a kind of expert in that genre, even though I'd never shot it before. Uh, and I like the idea of, with my perspective, finding my angle through it. You know, and then on the script, I, I, I wanted to collaborate it with, with some, someone American, especially because of my background and my European perspective. I like the idea because, of course, we were playing with genre tropes that mostly belong to American cinema, mm -hmm. if, even though not exclusively, but mostly. Uh, I like that our two different perspectives with, with Kevin Rice, who eventually became the screenwriter on the film, uh, you know, that collaboration, that formula. Uh, so I, I got asked that question a lot. <laughs> and, and my answer was always, look, I mean, uh, someone even suggested, oh, and then we'll have a great uh, second unit shoot your right. action scene. I'm, right. And I'm like, no, why? <laughs> I, I want to shoot the action scene. That's Those are the fun, that's the fun part. Somebody, I mean, I, uh, I mean the, of course, there are pro, I, 
look, we called amazing stunt, uh, a stunt, an amazing stunt coordinator and stunt performers to help us on the movie. That, of course. But why in conceiving the action? No, I want, I want to conceive the action. I want to, I want to decide how to shoot it, and tailor it on what this character is, the specificity of this character, who, by the way, happens to be a, not a, uh, you know, a trained killer. And on this story, on my tone, on my locations, which so, informs so much of what the tone of the film is. So, yeah, I got asked that question a lot. And it, always the argument is, look, I, you know, I, I find this story to be interesting, both because of this character's perspective, but also, you know, because of the genre. I love the genre. I want, I want to find my way into it. And it was sometimes it took hard convincing and sometimes probably it was not convincing. Uh, <laughs> but you got it done. But you, but you got it in. You got it done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what? independently, that's what's interesting. You know, we, I, look, we did go uh, around with the. Of course, the problem, aside from the genre too, is I, I had only with one, one feature, one dramatic so, feature, one dramatic feature, one dramatic feature. Yeah. So, of course, it was going to be hard. But then, you know, yeah, we got it done. It, it, it was, it was a lot of, it was a lot of hard work, and and of course. Having the the producers that I had as a team behind me, both because of uh, uh, you know their their amazing uh, credibility, but also be because of sheer work of you know finding the right people to talk to and, and proposing it correctly, setting up our our very difficult meetings in which I got asked those weird questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it was. It was all of those things. And, uh, at the, you know, I, I, for example, another example of that, what you ask is, oh, and then and then you could get an amazing DP who has a lot of experience in action. And I'm like, again, no, I, <laughs> I, I love to work with my DP who shot my first movie. He's my favorite DP in independent cinema. He's the best, uh, even though he has not action. He has not shot action. Oh, before. that's a, oh, that's I a want, tough. That was a tough I pill. I want me yeah. and him to find our action language that is ours and, and, you, and, and you know, our approach. And what I love about and I was telling you this before we started the conversation was I love the approach to the action in this film. It was so un-American in so many ways, which which you can – I mean I'm a connoisseur of cinema obviously. So when I was watching it, I was yeah. just like – Oh, this is so fresh. You could obviously tell this is a European director. This is not an American director in the best sense of the word because just the the, the focus on character, like I felt John David throughout the piece as opposed to just like some sort of puppet action, you know, 80s character who would just go without any depth. There was so much depth, so much emotion, so much pain in the action and in that character that was so wonderful. And just how you shot the action was was raw. And it felt like a constant um, roller coaster. Like you were, you you didn't give up. You didn't give. There was very moment. There was very few moments of break. Uh, you were just like you just on this thing. And you, like when you held on and you got a hold of the audience, you didn't let go, which I loved. I loved that part about the action. Well, I find that to be again. Uh, <clears throat> I guess depending on the kind of movie you want to make, there is a uh, where is your focus. And in many movies, I guess, that are more or less thrillers or action thrillers, spectacle is important. And, and as such, it sucks away, I guess, from other aspects of what can be explored. And in my case, I definitely wanted spectacle and the sense of adventure of this genre to be there. But I, I wanted to only get there through this character because I found that you know, having him be so specific, so unequipped for this experience, <laughs> going through everything that he's going through, aside from the experience with his own personal crisis, um, I found that that approach to this uh, arrival at the spectacle would be, uh, I guess, what unique we had to offer. And of course, this is enabled uh, aside from, you know, conceiving it and planning it by the amazing performance of John David. So, you know, one thing is, is you say, all right, so he decides he wants to, he's running away from danger. He wants to steal that bike. 
And I guess in a movie which focuses on spectacle, he steals the bike and he speeds through the streets, avoiding all sorts of dangers and gets away. In this movie, it does not go that way at all. Because, uh, you know, you try to steal a scooter from an angry Greek person who's going to do something very important. I want to see how that goes. You as an average person. And I like the idea even of playing around with this concept of, first of all, challenging the trope. And second, really thinking about how would it go for this character and not just for the sake of, you know, the spectacle and, again, doing what has been already well covered. Now, I, that, I guess that this, this angle uh, then informed, of course, how the action uh, uh, took place. Right, the exactly. Place. And, right. Then, and then, therefore, how it shot as a consequence. Right, exactly. And, and you, you can tell that you, you did not lead with spectacle. Though there is spectacle in the film, no question. Um, but it did not lead with that. And that's so wonderful about it. Now, I, I was and I was telling this to my wife when we were watching it. I'm like, I think John David's in every single scene, isn't he? There's not one scene he's not. It's, it's pretty much every scene he's in. Yeah, yeah. So that must have been brutal for him as an ad. Like he's, there's not a break. <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah, I joke with him. I joke with him that he actually ran much more than Beckett because he had to do takes. <laughs> exactly. Beckett only had to do it once. Uh, yeah. And I love and I love about him that you've given you gave him throughout his journey things that would slow him down, injuries and. You know, all these kind of things that I equate with uh, John McClane walking on barefooted on glass in Die Hard. Yeah. That yeah. you gave him a bunch of that. You didn't have to because it was stuff enough. But you added that extra level of stress um, to the character, which I thought was wonderful. It was just a nice little touch. Well, I think this actually has to do with, with uh, uh, as Quentin Tarantino would say it, I guess, uh, delivering the goods of the genre. Uh, and I'm and I'm quoting something. I remember him talking about uh, Reservoir Dogs, I guess, because mm -hmm. his he, he, the way he was presenting it, I remember. And then I stop referencing him. Uh, <laughs> uh, was uh, it's a heist film where you don't see the heist, but I still want to deliver the goods and the excitement of that kind of film. Okay, end reference. <laughs> uh, I, I get the the point to me. Uh, you know, the great the beauty and enjoyment of seeing a great manhunt thriller. Is it a kind of road movie? Yeah. You know, there's, you know, you have to escape and therefore you cover ground. And therefore ground, landscape, locations, they're very important. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, of course, okay, so uh, he, uh, he becomes, the danger arrives and he decides he wants to go to the U.S. Embassy, which happens to be not where he is at all. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Basically, in a, in a film like this and with this premise, uh, the landscape can change the story. Because mm -hmm. if there is one highway connecting him to the embassy, mm -hmm. it's one story. If there's five mountains, four rivers, seven trains and, uh, you know, a, a bunch of protesters, it's a different story, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that becomes part of the movie. So I, I, would, I would consider it, I guess, more than a touch, actually part of the flesh of the film and uh, it, I, I'll tell you that when I was uh, driving around mainland Greece where uh, I wanted to set the film looking for locations I sometimes even uh, s saw something that was so striking that it was kind of backwards compatibility <laughs> like okay so this is great let's adapt the scene so that it would work with this location because he goes through here then, you know, this happens as a consequence and he it stays with him for the rest of the film. Um, and, and in that sense, the land itself became a part of the movie. And I thought that was important for this type of movie, for that sense of adventure and spectacle. Yeah, of course. Now, do you have any advice for directing actors? Because, I mean, you have some amazing performances in Beckett. Well, uh, I, look, I am a little obsessive. So uh, I, I like to do a lot of research um, and collect material for myself, thinking about the characters and how, uh, you know, both in the writing process, but then also thinking about how to make them alive. Uh, and uh, and uh, 
I like to share that material with, with the actors I work with. That said, um, I would say my advice for, for filmmakers who are starting out is be absolutely open to the instinct and the quality specific to that actor. Because maybe sometimes when younger filmmakers come with so, much, so many ideas and so much excitement about, oh, this character has to be like this and like that, may very well be if you're the absolute master of you know, filmmaking, mm -hmm. but in many cases that's not true. Mm -hmm. And in fact, something like I was saying earlier in our conversation, that the actor might come out with with instinct or, or reacting to the, the material you share or or just from their own baggage. And it's something that you may not have imagined is much richer and more useful at the end of the day to the performance that you seek. So and that actually works differently from actor to actor. So I guess one has to have need, one needs that sensibility of understanding what is the level of dialogue and exchange uh, or even uh, how much you sort of want to give an actor or how much does another type of actor not want to receive very much and want to kind of do their own thing. That is difficult to master, I guess, when you're starting out, uh, finding that sensibility of, of uh, calibrating how you work mm -hmm. with whom. I, I, you know, at least that's how I do it. I, 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 you know, people are different. Actors have different personalities and different methods for sure. So I, I always come with my baggage and my preparation and the material I like to share and then see what happens and calibrate accordingly, according to what happens next, you know, and, yeah. and definitely be open to their instinct and everything that they can enrich. Now, what was the toughest day? that you had on set? What was the toughest production day? Like, you're like, oh my God, this is not gonna, we're not gonna make it. <laughs> There's always a day like that. <laughs> well, we're not gonna make it is not good attitude. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how can, how can we, how can we make it without, without me dying? <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> well, look, look, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the most obvious answer first. And uh, we have, uh, obviously there's a big, there's uh, two scenes, uh, one that is, a rally, a political rally, yeah, oh, where a yeah. politician is going to speak, and then late, and then stuff happens, and then later, that rally has turned into a riot. Okay, so these are two scenes that are set in the same square. Uh, we were lucky enough that uh, basically the the municipality of Athens allowed us to shoot in Syntagma Square, the Parliament Square, which is where, where you know, when they do rallies. They walk from areas of Athens, they, jo they join up, and they arrive in the Parliament Square. That's how it happens in reality. It happens to be humongous. No movie could ever cover it entirely because it's too big. However, they said, you can shoot there. And Okay, luxury, amazing, beautiful. But you have only one day. <laughs> okay, so, you know, it would be one thing to have one scene to shoot, but we had two. And they were different. <laughs> so, I, you know, that was the toughest day uh, on, on the most <sighs> obvious terms of what a tough day is. Right. Because, you know, of course, we had to plan everything. Of course, there were unexpected things. And we just had to deliver so much storytelling and also show so much uh, uh, stuff going on. Uh, plot moments. Also, that's near the end of the film. So there's a lot going on mm -hmm. plot wise. But there's also all these people to wrangle. But there's also the problem of even though we had a lot of extras, there was also 97% of the square was empty. <laughs> wow. It <laughs> didn't look it. Long. It didn't look it. But well, yeah, well, that's the thing. Yeah, you have to find the <laughs> angle. But then, okay, so that angle works. But then you have to go all the way there to shoot that scene. And then we had to go all the way there to shoot that other moment. And so it was a nightmare. You know, yeah. but we. It. <laughs> yeah, and then there's a big difference in production design from a rally to a riot, uh, as far as just the, right. the sets and all that stuff. So like, once you you're like, okay, did we get everything for the rally? Okay, now let's start breaking everything apart. Let's start setting some fires. Let's start, you know, putting some debris down, because you can't go back after you got one day. Yeah. You can't go back once you start. Once you've let that go, it's gone. <laughs> no, one thing we did manage to to uh, 
which is kind of funny if you know it when you watch the film, but I'll say it anyway, uh, is we did manage to go back to shoot a couple of sidewalks, which means basically that we shot, we shot the square scenes and then there's like a moment that's only on a sidewalk mm -hmm. and that all the characters are looking into the square to this amazing drama that's happening. And actually it was just full of traffic like every day, <laughs> you know? Does it? So, so you got you went and snuck and cut. That's the extent that we managed to sort of uh, do get something back. Uh, but you know, the bulk of it we shot on that day, and it was it was intense. You know, every twenty minutes we had to move and do something else, or we, you know, the scene would would be missing plot points. Right. And exactly. We couldn't we couldn't leave anything behind, and there was no uh, plan, no, no possible plan B. Now, what was it like um, collaborating with John David uh, as a, as a as a collaborator, as an actor? Uh, I mean, he it's a pretty intense relationship you guys must have had to do a film like this, since he's in every scene. It's action. You're in a foreign land and, and all this kind of stuff. How did how how was that collaboration? It was beautiful, and I think the first you know referencing again that first meeting that we had about the film. Um, we had a great conversation there, and I think we understood that we were in sync about our taste mm -hmm. and uh, the idea of playing with genre. He loves genre cinema as well, very much. And he liked this idea of, of approaching it from this odd angle with this odd character. So that informed a lot of our first conversation and then eventually our working relationship uh, because with this exciting understanding that started our dialogue, uh, it was all a, a nice sort of uh, exploration hunt for ways to best express it. Uh, so again, I had I had a bunch of material that I shared with him, a bunch of movies that I wanted to show him, and then he would react to those, and we'd had beautiful long conversations about why that was interesting, what we can take from that, what we should not take from that. Um, and so that was, I, I would say that was the most important part of creating that character, uh, or at least I, I guess informing that, uh, our working relationship leading to that performance. And then we did so much of that beforehand that by the time we got to set, we had short hat, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we had an understanding, we had a library of references to get to if we needed to like, Oh, uh, remember that moment from that movie? that you like for that and that reason, yeah, let's think of that. Or, or uh, um, you know, um, so she, we, I, we, we talked a lot about the relationship that Beckett has with his girlfriend April in the film and the meaning of that relationship. And because the two characters are so different from each other and yet they are completely in love. And uh, that, of course, because of what happens at the beginning of the film becomes important in the, the movie inside of Beckett throughout the rest of the story mm -hmm. uh what's going on uh in his personal crisis and you know it was it was again shorthand and easy to go back and reference that and the the thing about john david is is, is that he is obsessive extremely passionate and a master minimalist in many ways so that we had this baggage we had this dialogue and then he would just go with his instinct and that's when i got to sit back and enjoy uh, with, uh, with everything we talked about it all sort of went away and disappeared and then he, he went he came out with his talent and his instinct and then whatever we wanted to change it was again it was just like oh remember that thing we said about the relationship that she wished she could be but then you know that's lost and he thinks about it now <laughs> uh, it, just like 10 seconds conversation, it references a whole world that we already discussed beforehand. And we were able to have this complicity, which was, uh, you know, a privileged and gold to me. Uh, it also, you know, gave me confidence in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the everyday uh, production. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the one thing I and I want to just kind of point, put a little spotlight on what you just said is a lot of times first time directors or young directors don't realize how important collaborating with your lead actors are and they come in with their their ego their way of doing it and they're very kind of concrete about 
I want my character to do this, this, and this. And they block, and they just kind of disregard what the actor who's playing that character brings to the table. And only through working with actors, you understand that the magic, you're hiring them because they're bringing their magic to them, to this character. So I, I'm sure that Beckett was was created once on the page, but then once John David came in and then both of you started working together, it became what we see. And it wasn't just all your way along. And all the great directors do that because that's the way it should be, right? Well, that's how it becomes better. <laughs> <laughs> and, like and, you could take credit, and you could take credit for it as a director. <laughs> I'm joking. You know what I mean. No. Yeah, of yes course, of no. course. I'm joking, I'm the joking. Point, the point is exactly, uh, I mean... My mind is limited to being one mind. <laughs> uh -huh. right. I, 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 uh, I conceived the project. Mm -hmm. I put together pieces, but you know, it is only through collaborators who each at their own job is obviously much better than me, come contribute with their ideas. And this is, of course, most important with actors who ha define very much the, the final temperature of a movie. Mm -hmm. The, the soul of a movie in some ways um, and that that's that's kind of why I think when you hear when you reading about film history and stuff you're like oh and then this actor was going to play in that movie uh, but then you know he couldn't and then this other actor played and you're like I can't imagine that <laughs> and it's because it's because that you know the actor establishes I think the beating heart of the movie or the soul of the movie depending on how spiritual you are Mm -hmm. uh, so much that no matter how much you conceived around him and inside him, that talent and that baggage that inevitably an actor is, you know, Bertolucci always said, uh, uh, any feature fiction movie is at the end of the day, a documentary about the actors, you know, because they're actors and they act. But at the end of the day, there are these humans who go, who are able to go places and deliver what the what the story needs and you know and and uh you can't plan all of that it's impossible <laughs> it's silly and if you did it would be probably shallow you know very uh, and it is an actor's qualities and definitely with john david i i got lucky uh that that make whatever character is at play that real deep and you know in this case relatable warm uh, and strong at the same time. Now, when is uh, Beckett available for everyone to see? This Friday, the 13th of August. Okay. Very cool. I, I, and I, I tell it's a lucky everybody. Day I hear in America, it's, a, right? it's a fantastically lucky day. I think you'll do fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to ask a few questions I ask all my guests. Um, what advice do you wish you would have gotten at the beginning of your career? Um, think absolutely without boundaries, but then also, um, revise with critical editorial mind, you know, to find the essence of what you need to say, you know, when you're, when you're, when it's so, it's so expensive and difficult to make films that, you know, when you're starting out and you, it, it's difficult to get any scene made. It's costly and everything. And then you you cut stuff, and it's on the cutting room floor. And you're like, Jesus, you know, if I'd known <laughs> that I didn't need to shoot that, I would have shot, you know, the other stuff. Uh, so, and and it's impossible. I mean, you can't, you don't, you can't get there. But aspire to that, I guess, to that quality. And then, of course, sleep. <laughs> sleep 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 um so and, and would that be the advice you would give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today or would, would that be some other advice well i mean look it's, it's it would be a mistake i think to to say to give the advice of thinking practically uh like you know come up with something uh that you can make that's not too crazy i think that's wrong um i think one should uh follow absolutely their instinct and their need to, to, to tell stories. Why do you even want to make this in the first place? That reason is what should inform every single decision you make, including how ambitious the project is, how, how um, ambitious the project is, how big it is, 
And then, of course, you just have to be a realist and, and come with critical mind and understand how you can tailor it, let's say. Uh, so, you know, I guess it's a more complicated piece of advice, but that, that's how I feel I should have, uh, you know, if, if I'd known that more um, efficiently. It would have been, I would have been maybe faster <laughs> to put things together. <laughs> Very good. Now, three of your favorite films of all time. I like that you say three of my favorite things of, yes. films of all time. So it's not the favorite three necessarily. No, it's the three that come of currently as you as as we speak today. Well, I, I would like to at least with one or two reference stuff that inspired me for this film, uh, which remain among my favorite films of all time. And one is Three Days of the Condor by Sidney oh, Pollack. Wonderful film. Um, and another is Manhunt by Fritz Lang, mm -hmm. based on, a, on an amazing novel by Jeffrey Household called Rogue Mail. And the film and the novel are different, but both are masterpieces uh, for different reasons. And the film is amazing. It's called Manhunt, two words. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, what can I say? Uh, something more recent. Um, look, uh, uh, in reference to the amazing composer I got to work with, Ryuichi Sakamoto, I will say, I'm sure to your surprise, Snake Eyes mm -hmm. by Brian De Palma. Yeah, I remember Snake Eyes. I love course. that movie. Yeah. Oh, God, the opening sequence. Just the way that camera... Yeah. No, I, I just say it because I know in America it's like, oh, the movie with uh, not, uh, that's kind of uh, with the crazy Nicolas Cage, da, da 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 da. No, I love that movie and he is perfect in it. He's, um, he, you know, the, the character is crazy. Listen, <laughs> Nicolas Cage is a national treasure and that has to be stated okay. currently. I mean, I don't care what anyone says, Nicolas Cage is a national okay, treasure. Okay. Without okay, question, we're, on the same page. we're, we're on the absolutely same page. on the same page. Uh, I can watch his early performances, his crazy performances, his subtle performances. He's a national treasure. I enjoyed oh, Snake Eyes. Snake Eyes, uh, absolutely. That this, this, uh, this uh, again, speaking about uh, infusing genre with a personal touch, mm. Frank Palmer's touch, and with a drama, which you do not expect because you do not expect it when you walk into Snake Eyes. You expect spectacle. Uh, and uh, on a grand scale, but uh, but then you're like you're surprised to be touched and moved, and then more spectacle. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, well, when you can when you, when you can combine spectacle with character and emotion, well, then you have a hit. Uh, that's where some of the biggest you know some of the biggest blockbusters, Titanic. I mean, for God's sakes, and uh, those kind of films that have that you, you're able to do the spectacle, but there's an emotional core that people attach to. That's why th when you see these movies that come out of Hollywood, sometimes they're all spectacle. And then the, the executives are like, why didn't it make money? I'm like, cause you got no heart in it. It's not as just because you, you can, see, you can, much about the right. right. You can blow up, you can destroy the world a hundred times and we've seen it a hundred times. And it's not cool just to see that spectacle anymore. It has to be story. If you don't have story, you don't have character, you don't have something to hold on to. It's just empty. And in today's world, my God, we're bombarded with so much stuff that when you you want that attached. And I think that is, I think honestly, it's one of the things I love about Beckett is the connection, the human connection. I think that's all, what we all thrive for is human connection. And if you can connect to a story on an emotional level, the spectacle is just added cream uh, on top of the cake. Mm -mm. Yeah, I absolutely. I mean, I wish... Your statement was always true. <laughs> example, the example of Snake Eyes makes it not entirely true because I'm afraid that was not a hit. Oh uh, no! It's th there's always reasons for it not to be a hit, but yeah. but but they connect to you emotionally. And I think De Palma, the, yeah. and we can and we can go for an hour about De Palma because I'm a huge De Palma fan as well. Sisters and oh my god, just I mean amazing amount of stuff that he's done, and. It's so fascinating that he left Hollywood. He's like, I'm screw Hollywood. I'm just going to go to Europe and just make movies now the way I want to make them. And I'm like, thank God. And, and Fat Patel was beautiful. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, the, the movie he made in Paris. Yeah, oh, Amazing. stunning. It was stunning. No, no, it was, it was stunning. But the, and this is one thing I've always, I've said this to people uh, on the show as well, privately. It's unfortunate some of these amazing directors 
they might have a flop or something like that, or they have something that doesn't perform well, and then Hollywood takes the keys away from them. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's sad, you know, because I want to see another Peter Weir film. I want to see another Wolfgang Peterson film. You know, I want to see these kind of another Brian De Palma film, maybe with a little bit more money in, involved, so he can yeah, do yeah. what he does. And yet they take the, they take the keys away from. Him. So I'm so glad that someone like De Palma could just go to Europe and just make the movies he wants to make, how he wants to make them. I I would say that uh, some uh, you know it's interesting this cross pollination between Europe and America. Just like it's interesting for some European filmmakers to go work in America, you know, depending on the films they want to make. I think it's under understated, undervalued how much sometimes it's interesting, it's interesting that American directors go to Europe, not just because they can't make a film in America, but because the context oh. is different and maybe it could be stimulating in a different way. And, uh, you know, different things go uh, the taste is like, I, I, I think that cross pollination is all, you know, I believe in this idea of cinema is all one nation anyway. Mm -hmm. Each of us has their own culture from their own countries, but we all meet in the same land. And uh, I, I, you know, of course, we referenced a lot of American cinema or British cinema, but I, I'm also just as much inspired thinking again about Beckett by Hong Kong cinema mm. you know, and Johnny, oh. Toh, Johnny Toh movies. Uh, mm -hmm. or in Japan, Takashi Miike movies. Oh, uh, yep. So, so uh, sure. I mean, I love, I love to imagine uh, the u ubiquity of, yeah, I mean, of filmmakers in different landscapes. And, and, the, and, and, and we'll end it on this. There's one filmmaker who got to cross-pollinate over to America back in the 90s was Luc Besson. And he did, yeah. which he did Leon, which... Yeah. Is arguably still one of my favorite action films of all time, and mm -hmm. and I love his version of it actually, not the American version that was called the professional. Like when he added fifteen extra minutes that they cut out because it was too risque, uh, it actually made the story even better. Yeah, I guess that's what I mean with an American director. If he went to Europe, those fifteen minutes would be in there, you know? Right, and then we finally because Luc Besson became Luc Besson that the studio is like, well, maybe we should let him have his director's cut, and that came out, and it was Leon. Uh, which was originally the called Leon, but they never thought it would be. But the reason why that movie works so beautifully is the emotion. I mean, you're you're crying at the end of an action movie. It's just brilliant. And that by is by the way, yeah. for, for a character who is most definitely despicable. <laughs> he's a killer. <laughs> he, yeah. He's an but the thing that makes his character so wonderful is that he's basically, you know, just a he's so loving with his plant. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and also he kills bad people. He doesn't kill and, good and people. And more importantly, Gary Oldman is much more despicable than him. You so, have to. You if know. you don't have Gary Oldman, then it's hard to root for Leon. But yeah. because you've got Gary Oldman, who is just so oh, oh god, what a performance that was! Yeah, oh yeah. god. All right, we could geek out about movies all night. But listen, uh, Fernando, thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been a pleasure. I wish you continued success. Beckett was is a triumph, and I, and I hope everybody uh, watching Netflix gets a chance to watch it uh, this Friday, August the thirteenth. A very lucky day here in America. <laughs> thank you, Alex. <laughs> My friend, thanks again. Thank you.